Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is Marissa Waterman, and I'm the Marketing Director here at American Academy of Environmental Engineers and Scientists. We're happy to be here today with Tom Ramsey, a Senior Principal from Geosyntec Consultants. He's been a practicing professional engineer since first becoming licensed in Georgia in 1994. His primary expertise is in civil and environmental engineering as it applies to solid and hazardous waste projects. Tom has been with Geosyntec since 2002, and prior to that, he worked as an engineer and regional manager for a major private solid waste company. Before we get started, I just want to mention that you'll be able to message your questions at the end of the presentation. Once the presentation's over, you'll be able to type your question into the attendee chat panel on the left-hand side of your screen. We'll also share Tom's email address that you can email him directly with any additional questions you may have. Okay, let's get started. Good morning, Tom. Thank you for joining us today. Good morning. Thank you, Marissa. I appreciate the opportunity to speak. Let me get our, um, uh, let me turn off the camera here and then I will load my presentation and then we can get started. Hopefully that is on a full screen for everyone. All right. Thank you for everyone for attending today. I want to talk a little bit about engineering ethics um, and uh, some experience from my own uh, experience of doing uh, being an engineer for 30 years now. Um, some folks, you know, may say, "Well, this is why are we doing engineering ethics uh, at this point?" Um, you know, I've been a practicing engineer or scientist for a long time, and I, I've been giving these uh, webinars within Geosyntex now for several years, and I personally have found them to be quite helpful. It's, it's nice from time to time to be able to step back, kind of look at the big picture of what we're doing and why as professionals, and see the importance that it has uh, on our communities around us. So I hope that you guys will find this to be uh, helpful for you today. Uh, here's an outline of what we'll be going through today. I want to start off with the American Society of Civil Engineers. They have a very a good uh, set of a code of ethics that would apply to all of us as professionals, as engineers and scientists. Talk a little bit more about a uh, kind of a technical term uh, about licensing and responsible charge, uh, and then uh, go into a few case studies that have occurred for my own career, um, and then finish up with a little just sort of general overview on how all of us as professionals can, can try to avoid those sticky situations where uh, things start getting uncomfortable for us. Um, it, this is meant to provide a, a, a professional development hour for those who are required uh, to have that on the topic of ethics. Uh, as you will talk a little bit later on, it is important to know whether or not, um, within the, depending on the state in which you're licensed, uh, this may or may not apply. So it's going to be up for you to, to figure out whether that's the case. And I do want to give a shout out to one of my colleagues, Scott Graves, who uh, originally got me on the topic of ethics and helped me with this, this um webinar we give today is a heavily modified version of one that he had given earlier. Um, so we're going to start off talking with the American Society of Civil Engineers. Here's their, uh, their web page address, a lot of helpful information on there uh, with regard to the issue of ethics. Uh, there are seven ethics that we go through with the American Society of Eng Civil Engineers. We'll just go through each one of them here briefly. Uh, the first canon here uh, with regard to holding paramount uh, safety, health, and welfare of the public and also striving uh, for um, sustainable development should be fairly uh, obvious uh, on the surface for all of us. But we also, I mean, the reality is we live in a world in which um, there is also a lot of pressure with regard to schedule, with regard to budget, with regard to profitability. And uh, sadly, at times, those, uh, those goals uh, can work against this very basic canon that we really are um, stewards of a public trust. Uh, as engineers and scientists, we have uh, a special um, training that we've been given, a special ability to review things that the general public does not have. Uh, and in that, in our professions, it's uh, very uh, important that we um, consider that as we uh, do our practice. For canon number two, uh, we need to uh, consider that we only do perform our professional services in the areas of our competence. Uh, examples being uh, electrical engineering, structural engineering, stormwater, etc. Again, seems fairly straightforward, but um, there are many cases uh, in, in where I've looked at disciplinary cases from many states uh, where particular professionals have um, 
in fact, sort of uh, set off to the side and just sealed things that were not in their area of competence uh, simply because it was convenient and ended up getting themselves into some pretty heavy duty trouble. So important that we stay focused on our areas of competence. Uh, with regard to public statements that we make in an objective and truthful manner, um, I sadly uh, have, uh, have, have seen many cases uh, in the 30 years in which I've been practicing where um, engineers and scientists, uh, rather than sort of following facts and, uh, and, and rolling things to logical conclusions, have in fact uh, sort of ignored data or manipulated data in order to come to sort of a prearranged conclusion. Uh, from time to time, I get involved in um, uh, expert uh, litigation cases where I've been retained as an expert engineer uh, in a litigation case. There's often a, an engineer that's been uh, uh, retained by the opposing side as well. Um, in those cases where I am retained by a lawyer, uh, I am very clear up front to let them know that uh, my intent on the case is to follow the facts and the data and come to the reasonable engineering conclusion based on that and share that with them. Now, if it turns out that that uh, is helpful for that case, their case, that's great. If it's not helpful, at the end of the day, uh, it's important that the, that the legal counsel knows that they've got a hole in their case with regard to technical issues uh, and they need to address that with their client. It is not my job, nor is it any engineer's job, to manipulate facts, to look at things only halfway or to put spin on things for the sake of a legal case. Um, I, I think in our culture today, I think all of us would agree that there are uh, sadly a circumstance where uh, scientific facts are being um, ignored in the public, uh, they're being spun in the public, and I think uh, we need to be careful to not be unwary uh, participants or willing participants in that. As engineers and scientists, it's very important that we follow the science and not um, a prearranged conclusion. The uh, next uh, code of ethics regarding Canon 4 is uh, obviously not being involved in a conflict of interest. Uh, conflict of interest is where we are working uh, on both sides of one project or uh, potentially a circumstance where it could be perceived that we're not able to give uh, a truthful and objective assessment of the facts. Um, an example of that from my own career occur, occurred just a couple of years ago. I uh, was a design engineer on a, a large construction project. There was a second engineering firm that had been hired to provide construction management, construction quality assurance oversight. Um, as with the course of any construction project, um, there were uh, requests for uh, change orders by uh, the contractor doing the job. Uh, and in the review of those change orders from time to time, there can be conflict, as we all know, where a contractor believes that additional money or schedule is justified, whereas uh, the construction manager and engineer may not believe that it's justified, and we've got to work through that. Well, about a year into this project, it was a multi-year project, um, the firm that had been hired for construction management and quality assurance uh, also took a job uh, with the same contractor on a different project where they were had been retained by that contractor to provide uh, support to them uh, for this separate project. And so in that case, it put our the client, the owner of this project, in a pretty bad situation because uh, they were no longer able to be sure that um, this firm that had been hired for construction management was really giving an objective assessment with regard to change orders on that project, since uh, that firm is also being paid by the contractor on another job. So it's very important, uh, for, especially for large engineering firms uh, with multiple clients, uh, tend to get kind of a tangled web of, uh, of clients, and it's important that we uh, follow through those conflicts of interest. It doesn't mean that when we work for one uh, particular firm that we can never work for anybody else, um, but it does mean that we need to be careful to, to uh, avoid conflicts of interest. Uh, with regard to um, working uh, or competing in the marketplace in a fair uh, and, uh, and, and appropriate manner, um, again, here's a common case where I think uh, inappropriate uh, uh, ethical things occur is with the case with subcontracting where we team together on large projects. 
Uh, I've been involved in several uh, cases where Geosyntec Consultants was a sub to a larger firm, and we were teamed together to go after a large project. Uh, and, and, and so as a team, we were able to present ourselves with our various skill sets and um, abilities. And in, uh, sadly, in a couple of cases, we had won that work. Uh, and then after we won the work, um, the, the firm that we had subcontracted to uh, either cut us out of the work or uh, greatly eliminated or you know, reduced our scope to just a fraction of what uh, we had been promised early on in the in the uh, teaming agreement. So in these cases, that's clearly an ethical problem. Um, we should be honest and open and honest with uh, our colleagues, open and honest with our subs, uh, and with all that we deal with, um, even in the in the comp in the realm of competition. The reality is we can't win them all, and, and that's okay. We, we move on. Six Canon, uh, hopefully it should be fairly uh, straightforward to everybody here as they read it with regard to bribery and fraud. This uh, is, is something that uh, none of us should ever be involved with in our professional careers. Uh, it does happen from time to time. You'll see a little bit later on in my presentation, uh, I do an analysis of um, of, of violations, engineering violations, where there have been discipline in many states. Uh, there's a particular category of those called uh, uh, violations or convictions of moral tor torpitude. And in those cases, almost every one of them is related to somebody bribing uh, someone in order to win work. Um, so obviously, we live in the real world. This is an issue. It can be a temptation from time to time. And it's important that we be careful about that. One area that's not directly bribery, but something that we just need to take care about is uh, with regard to entertaining our clients or being entertained by our vendors uh, as we move forward. Um, there's certainly nothing wrong with having a lunch together and discussing projects uh, and, and those kinds of things, but uh, I think we all can agree that at some point it, it can sort of cross over uh, into gray areas, and all of us as professionals need to be very careful about that uh, in our careers, that we would not um, get ourselves uh, caught up in a situation where um, somebody might be asking questions about our, our ethics with regard to winning work. Uh, and then the last uh, canon pro uh, provided is regarding uh, professional development. Uh, many of us uh, on the phone call here, I assume, are supervisors over um, uh, very good. I'm getting some uh, canons with regard to additional canons. We can talk about that later um, when we get to the uh, later part of the talk. With regard to the canons, the, um, many of us are supervisors and we have responsible charge over uh, those uh, that are underneath us. And in those cases, uh, I hope that we are encouraging people to grow in their career. Uh, that in, as professionals, what we're being asked to do is much more uh, than just offer jobs to people, but giving them an opportunity to grow uh, in their knowledge and their skill set in the profession. So I would hope that we would um, be uh, offering that up to the subordinates and encouraging that within our organizations. I want to step away from uh, the ASCE uh, ethics code at this point and um, move on to discussing uh, licensure and responsible charge. Um, for professional engineers uh, in the United States, all 50 states, uh, we have to be licensed in the individual state in order to be eligible to practice engineering in that state. Uh, in order to, to place our PE seal or work on that job, we must have what is called responsible charge, which I'll talk about in our next slide, in, in order to be able to perform that work. Uh, we can't just simply come in and look at something briefly and then agree with it, and then uh, take responsibility for it. Um, that is, is not ethical in any of the states practicing. Uh, also, in many states, in the United States, we're required to have a certificate of authorization or the equivalent of that in order to practice engineering in the state. In that case, it's generally not for individuals. It is generally for um, companies uh, in, in order to uh, essentially get their own license for engineering. Uh, in some states, it's actually uh, quite specific, and there are some very specific requirements that go with regard uh, to the corporate organization in order to get that certificate of authorization. So just say that from the standpoint of uh, that we need to take care uh, when we are doing work in maybe the first time in a new state, 
that we need to make sure that we are properly licensed, both as professionals and for the companies that we work for. All right, let's talk a little bit about responsible charge. Um, when we do uh, work, uh, what it means to take responsible charge for a project is we are effectively taking the engineering liability for uh, what, we, what we are sealing. And in order to do that, uh, we need to be able, first of all, to be obviously have competence in that area, uh, but we also have to know the background data, be able to dictate the means and methods of the work, uh, be able to supervise if there are more than one uh, person that's involved on the project, or we've got subordinates working on it, we have to be able to supervise their work uh, and be able to do that in a reasonable manner where we are frequently communicating with them from start to finish um, so that we can have input on the project and are familiar with the details of the work um, so that we understand what the assumptions are behind the work, um, that a, a reasonable uh, set of uh, a reasonable um, scope of work was completed to address the issues that need to be addressed and that we have had input on it um, in order to uh, be able to take responsibility for it. What it doesn't mean, uh, let me step back here for a minute, it doesn't mean that you necessarily have to do all of the work yourself or that you're not able to reference the work of others but it does mean that you have to be able um, to have control of the work in the end before you seal it. I'll talk about this a little bit in a case study from my own career a little bit later on in our talk today. And then uh, let's move on, on to unlicensed practice. Um, this is probably in, the, in my last assessment, uh, which we'll see uh, in the next slide as I go through a number of states uh, that have public records with regard to um, engineering violations. Unlicensed practice is probably, if not the most uh, common uh, violation of engineering. It's, if it's not the most, it's certainly in the top two or three uh, virtually every year. Um, unlicensed practice, uh, as I talked before, you need to be licensed both as an individual in the state and for your organ. If you are working for a company, your company has to be licensed in that state. It's important that you are licensed before you make a proposal if you're an engineering firm. It's not something you get after the fact. Um, in many states, uh, examples I've looked at in the past, for example, in West Virginia, um, they've had uh, multiple cases where uh, firms went out, proposed on work, won it, and then uh, got their licensing uh, after they won the work but before they started the work. And in the state of West Virginia, for example, that is considered unlicensed practice. So it's important that we do that. Also important that when you propose on the cover letter for your proposal or, or the other thing that you have a licensed individual on that cover letter is it documents that you are licensed. Um, sealing something when your license is lapsed and then getting it reinstated later is unlicensed engineering. Um, I know that, you know, as I personally am licensed in 13 states, uh, so I have to, you know, do a lot of um, renewals every year or every other year, and so you have to be take care to make sure that you're organized that you don't let one of those licenses lapse. Not unheard of that one might lapse, um, and that in and of itself is not a violation of engineering ethics, um, and we move forward to get our license reinstated. But in that meantime, in that gap period, uh, we are technically an unlicensed engineer in that state, and so we should not be working. Um, with regard to expert work, if you're someone who's involved in litigation support, preparing expert uh, reports, uh, that is a gray area. In some states, um, doing any uh, expert work is considered the practice of engineering, and you may put yourself in jeopardy of being um, accused of unlicensed practice. In other states, uh, expert work is not con is considered exempt from licensing. So I would just as an advice for anyone who's considering uh, doing um, uh, expert work in a particular state that you do a little. If you're not licensed in that state, that you do some research first to make sure um, that uh, you're okay before you take on um, that assignment. Uh, and then professional development hours. Uh, this is, if, again, uh, this seems to go neck and neck with unlicensed practice as being the, the number one source of uh, engineering violations that I see when I review records in individual states. Uh, it's a 
frequent cause of violations. It's, uh, and it's responsible that we understand what the requirements are in each one of our states that we're licensed in. Uh, some states, for example, um, like New York State, uh, are very particular about what it takes to be licensed to accept a professional development hour. They require uh, individual courses to be pre-registered and accepted by the state before they are allowed. Um, other states are uh, much more um, broad in their acceptance of professional development hours. Uh, they don't require uh, you to get them from licensed uh, firms or individuals. Um, and so it's a lot easier to get them in those states. In all cases, though, uh, my strong recommendation is that whenever you get a professional development hour, that you certainly get a certificate of completion or that you document that you did it, that you take notes as part of while you're doing the, uh, while the uh, professional development hour is going on so that you can document that you were there and that you were paying attention and that we should expect to get audited. Um, I, uh, as I mentioned, I've licensed in 13 states, been an engineer now for uh, about 30 years. Uh, about 20 of those 30 years, um, the states of various states have begun to enact the requirements for professional development hours. And uh, I have been personally have been audited uh, four times uh, in my career, uh, once in Maryland, uh, once in West Virginia, once in Kentucky, and once in South Carolina. So um, you should expect to get audited. And it's important that, um, so having these, these simple things of keeping records of your professional development hours and taking notes uh, make life a whole lot easier when that audit notice does come. Okay, want to uh, shift gears here a little bit, talk a little bit um, about um, professional develop, uh, discipline cases from the last two years that I did some research on over the last few months. Um, many states, uh, their uh, discipline records are open records. They're easily Googled uh, and found either through the, uh, the professional engineering website on the state or in many cases just simply Googling an individual's name, uh, you will find these case records coming up. Uh, I say this as a word of warning to all of us uh, as licensed professionals. Um, should you get disciplined, uh, that does in many states becomes part of a permanent record. Uh, it is easily researched. It can be researched back many years. Uh, I've been able to find discipline records in some states going back to 2010 and earlier. Uh, you will be named as an individual and the particulars of your uh, disciplinary case will be put in the public sphere. So it's certainly something that none of us want to have uh, happen to us. And so it's very important that we just simply take care uh, to not get caught up uh, in an accusation of uh, some sort of violation of uh, engineering ethics or engineering practice in our state. So for this example today, uh, I was able to research data from 17 states. Uh, I was looking purely for engineers and engineering firms, not um, uh, professional licensed surveyors or architects. And in these 17 states, uh, I was able to uh, research about 180 violations and that were on, you know, on, on air or available for review. So here's kind of a breakdown uh, of those uh, violations. I, I, just for the sake of organizing them, put them into six categories uh, that you'll see on the screen there, ranging from unlicensed practice to that conviction of a crime of moral turpitude, which uh, pretty much was bribery in most of the cases, uh, the various ethics violations and whatnot. As you'll see uh, from this example of the 180 violations I looked up, more than half of them were regarding unlicensed practice. Uh, many cases where people got tripped up because they had allowed their license to lapse, uh, did engineering, they went back and got their license, but in that gap period um, they got caught and ended up uh, being uh, fined for unlicensed engineering. Uh, many cases we had engineering firms uh, that went into states where they had not gotten certificates of authorization yet and had been convicted of unlicensed practice. In all of these cases of professional discipline, um, the individual states and their engineering boards are the sole arbiters of whether or not of, of the facts of the case and whether or not you're guilty. Um, so uh, it is
is important that you understand the individual requirements for individual states as you practice. Uh, with regard to uh, the ethics violations, which was number two uh, on the, the ones I looked at, more than 20% of the ethics violations uh, here, most of those were actually related to discipline practices that had occurred in a different state, but that professional had been licensed in more than one state, and they did not uh, uh, notify the other states in which they were licensed that they had been uh, convicted or they had been found to have a, a, a convicted of an engineering discipline case in a different state. In virtually every state, um, if you are uh, convicted of an engineering discipline in one state, you are required to notify all the other states in which you were licensed. Uh, so that in and of itself is, is a violation of engineering uh, rules in many states and can end up giving you another, you end up with this cascading discipline where getting disciplined in one state, failure to notify others turns into another discipline case, which turns into another discipline case, and so on and so forth. So if you ever do get caught up uh, in an engineer where you end up being disciplined for engineering, it's very important that you notify the other states in which you are licensed about it. Okay, I want to talk a little bit um, about ethics case studies uh, from, from uh, my own career. Uh, in which uh, I've been involved with. So here's one, uh, the use of report templates. Um, I've had many cases where uh, I've had a client that had a, a pretty uh, short fuse deliverable that needed to be done. Uh, examples of spill prevention countermeasures control plan, a uh, very quick geotechnical report where they might be doing a couple of borings uh, associated with the expansion or the, the, you know, an expansion being put onto an existing pre-engineered metal building. You know, something like that that might be done in only a couple of weeks. Um, often in those cases, uh, there may be an existing report that was prepared uh, by another consultant. Um, and the client has it because they're keeping good records of other stuff, and they may just hand it to you because it's a means to cut down on uh, the amount of effort. There's no sense in starting with a blank sheet of paper uh, when we are putting together something like a spill prevention plan or a geotechnical report. So we now have the template and off we go. So I asked sort of the rhetorical question, is there a potential pitfall out there? Uh, since this is an engineering ethics webinar, obviously the answer is going to be yes. So let's take a look at uh, where some of the areas are that we can get ourselves in trouble with regard to report templates. First of all, uh, one of the basic things that we all can use going back to our days in college is that we need to be able to give references and cite uh, where we got information. It's important that we don't simply pass off other people's work as our own. own. Um, just as a wisdom perspective as well, it also limits your liability as a professional engineer. If you're relying on the work of someone else uh, as part of your report, as an assumed uh, parameter for a particular um, piece of information, for example, then uh, it's important that we identify where we got those, those sources. Um, but it's important that we do not just simply take someone else's report in the Word file, change out the logo, uh, you know, change out the date, change a couple of pieces of data, and then re refile the report. That is a violation of, of of taking someone else's work and using it as your own. Again, it doesn't mean that we don't use templates and we don't use other background data, um, but it does mean that we just simply don't plagiarize pieces of work from others. Easy way to get around that, in many cases, uh, you've got um, state-issued uh, templates for reports that everyone is required to submit in the same way. Uh, obviously, when you use those, those uh, standardized templates, then we are um, doing fine with regard to uh, using those over and over again for our own reports, permitting checklists and things like that. It's simple, this is just a simple plea for us that we do, do a little bit more care about um, referencing other folks' works and a little bit more care about making sure that the work we do uh, is properly our own within the context of, you know, not going back to college where, you know, you're never allowed to use anything that anybody else does. 
So case study number two is regarding the rep responsible charge. Um, I've had many cases in my career where um, I've had to provide, I've had clients who have asked me to provide certification statements. So in those cases, I've got to um, seal a document uh, as a professional engineer um, to state that uh, I have reviewed this and I believe that it is um, reasonable and appropriate within you know, proper engineering care. Uh, here are uh, three examples on my slide here of very common things uh, that I've been asked to do. Again, often in these cases, uh, our client doesn't, the client may not have a whole lot of budget. It may be something that um, they've got to hurry up and get done because it just sort of slipped their mind and, and, they, and the thing is due on Friday and here we are on Wednesday. Hey, you know, I get a quick phone call. Hey, I've, I've just got to get this uh, uh, revised closure, post-closure cost estimate into the state and it's due on Friday. Hey, can you just, I've, I've got the one that I had last year. Can you just seal it for me real quick? And then I can, you know, check the box and move on. So it's important uh, in those cases, in any case where we would seal stuff, but essentially, especially in these spots where we've got these sort of very simple, quick hitting things that we need to be a little bit careful and step back for a minute and think about what it means to be responsible charge before we seal something as a professional engineer. So appropriately, in order to, we need to meet the responsibility, of, meet the criteria for responsible charge. Um, it means that we uh, have the knowledge of the details in the work, as I mentioned before, that we understand the assumptions that went in uh, into the background, that we have the ability to make modifications uh, to the document, that it's not a situation where we're just being handed something, told that it's fine, go ahead and seal it, and then move on. And those are the cases that clearly are not meeting the requirements of responsible charge. And when one of the basic ways in which we show that we uh, have met our requirements as professionals is that we document our review. It might be a quick memo that's sent out. It might be an internal calculation page, something. It doesn't necessarily have to be something that's sent back to the client, but that we do document the fact that we had received information, uh, we had a chance to review it, had a chance to look at the assumptions. Based on this, we believe this is reasonable. Therefore, we're going ahead to seal it. Um, the reality is, is as professionals, um, the fact that, that we are required to be licensed, that we've gone through all of the hassles associated to get licensed, all of the education, the tests, the experience requirements, um, that makes our work valuable. And so it's important that we remember that, that we don't just give away um, our experience and our value. It just, it, it, frankly, it denigrates the profession, it makes us, um, and it, it just puts us at risk. So it's important that even when we get these little quick things, it doesn't mean that we can't do it quickly, it doesn't mean that we can't do it for a modest uh, amount of effort, um, but it does mean that we don't just skip over the requirements of responsible charge and move on and seal things. Another case studies regarding professional development hours. Uh, here is an example of the letter that I got from uh, the state of Kentucky a few years ago with regard to their note of their audit of me uh, and my professional development hours. Um, as you can see, when they, when they do an audit, the expectation is that you are sending them back written documentation that shows um, that the hours that you have taken credit for, you have in fact completed. So in this case where I got this audit um, for the licensing period for 2016, or for the years um, 2014 and 2015, uh, I pulled out my documentation that I just keep in a file. You can keep it online now, you know, scan stuff and keep it, you know, in your, in your computer. Uh, but I pulled the stuff out of my file. I was able to scan uh, all of the certificates that I had maintained for each of the hours that I had kept. Uh, I keep at least one page of notes on each, so I also scanned my handwritten notes uh, on each one of the certificates. Uh, and then I was able to uh, package it all up, send it off as a scan um, to in an email uh, to the state of Kentucky within a couple of days. And about a week later, I got uh, a thank you from them uh, for meeting the requirements of the audit, and that was the end of it. 
in cases where I've done research on people who have gotten engineering discipline for not uh, for fraudulently claiming professional development hours that they didn't complete, uh, a very common scenario that you see is that the audit gets sent uh, to the individual. Um, that first notice generally gets ignored for about a month. Um, the state will typically send a second or maybe even a third notice that they're required that they're required to provide documentation for the audit. Uh, about the time of the third notice, that individual sort of realizes they're not going to be able to just sort of ignore it. And then there becomes a little bit of a dance of communication where they say, well, I, uh, I didn't do a really good job documenting all of my hours. And they say, well, send us the documentation you have. And then they either don't have documentation to send it or the documentation they send was for a bunch of professional development hours that they hurried up and got in the last couple of days uh, that don't meet the time requirement. And then, you know, eventually at some point, uh, sort of the gig is up and they admit that they did not get the professional development hours that they were required to get. And then the discipline um, moves forward at that point, which is typically uh, a re uh, requiring someone to take an engineering ethics course, um, complete all their professional development hours, and then there's usually a pretty stiff fine that comes with it as well, something on the order of $1,000 to $1,500. So, um, again, for those who are licensed on the phone call, I uh, just plead with you to just take those simple notes, keep your documentation, because the chance of you getting uh, audited is not insignificant. Um, next case I want to talk about that uh, for Geosyntec Consultants, uh, we, uh, we're, you know, we're an engineering firm that does geotechnical engineering. We do environmental engineering projects um, of various sorts, but things that we don't do, for example, is we uh, are not structural engineers. We are not electrical engineers. Um, so in those cases, we are commonly uh, uh, contracting a subconsultant. When we have a project, let's say we're putting together a, a drawing set, a construction drawing set um, that includes uh, uh, electrical design as, you know, for a bunch of pumps uh, that might be part of a project that we're working on. So uh, we've hired a sub-consultant and now we've got to uh, get them to prepare drawings and specifications and incorporate them uh, into this larger design set that Geosyntec is preparing. Um, that's going to go out to bid to the public. So the question is, how do we how do we address that? We've got a subconsultant who's doing engineering work that's not ours. So the appropriate way to manage that is what we will do is we will have uh, the subconsultant um, put their logo uh, on on the drawings that they are preparing. So it's an electrical engineering firm. Um, there's usually a set of electrical drawings that are attached uh, in the back of the drawing set. So our subconsultant will have them clearly identified as their work because their logo is on those drawings. Um, the professional engineer for our subconsultant who did the work will seal their own drawings. Um, and then there's commonly technical specifications that go with it. So in those technical specifications that our subconsultant prepares. We'll ask them to uh, put their name, their company firm name, in the header uh, for the engineering, uh, for, the, for the technical specifications for the package. So it's very clear that who did what and who's sealing what. So it's not a situation where me, Tom Ramsey, as a professional engineer whose expertise is in civil and environmental engineering, that I am not sealing uh, an electrical de uh, design set. Um, if you've got a large set of specifications, you may end up, for example, with two, off in many cases, we've got to seal our technical specifications along with the drawings. So you would have more than, you'd have your subconsultants sealing um, the cover sheet for those technical specifications as well. Simply a matter of identifying who did what. It's fairly clear. Uh, it should be fairly intuitive for us, but in many cases, people get mixed up, and then we can get ourselves in trouble. Um, and then the uh, the last case study that I want to talk about is, is regarding uh, data that we work with in the field, construction quality assurance data. And one of the things that we are often asked to do is be involved uh, in documenting um, 
a project uh, that has been constructed in conformance with um, design plans and specifications. And here's an example of one that I've had happen uh, personally in my career where we um, are working on a landfill cell construction project. A uh, project has fallen behind schedule for whatever reason. Maybe the contractor is struggling a little bit. Maybe we've had a, a really bad weather period and things have just fallen behind, maybe some other issue. And uh, in some cases, we've had cases where the contractor is struggling a little bit to get their work done uh, within the requirements of the project. An example of that might be um, when we're doing landfill construction, uh, we often put in low permeability clay layers in the bottom liner of the landfill as one of the barrier layers to prevent uh, groundwater contamination uh, once the landfill is up and in operation. And that clay often has to be constructed within a very tight window with a very specific, mo a very specific moisture content, a very specific uh, uh, density. And then we uh, do sort of uh, after the fact in situ testing in order to confirm that the permeability of that clay falls within required parameters for the design set. Um, there are times when contractors really struggle getting that work done properly. Uh, maybe the material is going in too wet, maybe they're not able to compact it properly. And I haven't had cases where contractors are following behind me, uh, complaining about my work, that I'm being nitpicky, that we're just, you know, uh, uh, doing stuff to delay the project themselves. And I've had a case where uh, in situ low permeability testing, which is done with a Shelby tube, I had a contractor where we've taken a test at one spot, they've come in right behind me. Uh, and taken a test uh, six inches away from that. They sent it to their lab, we sent it to ours. Uh, our lab showed a failing result, their lab showed a passing result. And then the contractor the next day or the next construction meeting is pounding the table uh, demanding that his results be accepted because and that this, the work ought to be uh, moved forward. So the question is what do you do in that circumstance where you've got failing data, maybe you've got conflicting data between laboratories. Um, I would suggest uh, in that case um, that the appropriate thing to do is that we cannot, as professionals, uh, ignore failing data. Uh, you can't just say, well, you know, yeah, you got one pass, one fail, we'll take, we'll take the good data and skip the bad. There has to be some logical explanation to address the failing data. Uh, for example, if you get a failing Shelby tube test where the permeability is too high, if you rework the area, recompact the clay, and then retest, and the test passes, then, then that shows that you've done your work. Uh, if you can identify that, that um, there was a different test method, for example, and that uh, if you change the results over to reflect the uh, different test method, that it would pass, then that's fine. But you can't just say, you can't just cherry pick the data in order to show a passing result. That does not meet uh, the responsibility that we have in our in our uh, ethical responsibility in our careers. Um, other things that we need to do when we are faced in a situation where there's conflict on a construction site and you've got a contractor that's pushing hard uh, with regard to accepting work is we need to rely on the contract documents. Uh, they should be very clear with regard to what is what is failing um, and what is not and we need to follow those and make sure that things are done properly. Uh, if there's a question that uh, maybe there is uh, a conflict in the document, the design documents, or maybe uh, the, desi the, the design methods that were required in the documents were not really constructible, then it's certainly okay to go back to the designer to review the basis of the design and make a revision. Um, that happens all the time. Uh, I'm involved in those in construction projects that I'm the designer in frequently. I uh, might have a situation where I've got a conflict between technical specifications, uh, or maybe there was a typo or something in the specification, and it's brought to my attention, and we can revise what the standards are, and then you know relook at um, at what the data is with regard to acceptance of the contractor's work. But at the end of the day, it's important to remember that at the bottom line, somebody has to have a backbone when it comes to construction. Uh, sometimes you got to be the bad guy, and despite getting pressure to accept uh, uh, on work that does not meet the requirements of a project. 
That's critically important. <clears throat> We've got, in some cases, um, we have environmental performance or, in some cases, even life safety is on the line that things are constructed as they were designed. Um, so there are times when we just have to be the bad guys. And it's one of the hard things of being a professional. Thankfully, it doesn't happen very often, but all of us need to have a backbone. So in general, just kind of summarize a little bit here since we're down to the last 10 minutes or so and then we can take some questions. Um, here are basic things that we can do to avoid unethical behavior in our practice. Um, peer review, it's very important that we get others involved uh, to help review our work. To, if we ever have a question that something uh, doesn't seem right, uh, it's always helpful to ask somebody, uh, get other folks' opinions within our, within our organizations. That helps a lot with regard to staying out of trouble. It's also important to know the current regulatory requirements. Um, I, I think at some point here, for example, even today, my, my uh, presentation day on the, on the cannons is obviously a little bit dated. As I mentioned, that we've got eight cannons from ASC now instead of seven. And that we need to stick to the facts. I, I just I want to emphasize this over and over again. As engineers and scientists, we are the people who should be following the facts wherever they go to their logical conclu conclusion. We should be the people who are the advocates for the science. We're not the advocates for the conclusion that one particular group wants us to go to. But we, and if it happens that the that the science and the facts lead us to the conclusion that people want us to have, then that's great. But there are times, occasionally and thankfully only rarely, but there are times when people are trying to spin and manipulate us as scientists and as engineers, and we need to be able to say no and stick with the facts. So that's my presentation today. We've uh, I've got 1251 here, so we've got a, a few um, comments that are in there. Here we go. Uh, it's not the current. Here we go for a comment from Nicholas uh, about the ASC Code of Ethics that was completely revised in October 2020. Uh, thank you, Nicholas. I uh, appreciate that comment on there. Obviously, I must confess that my uh, my presentation here uh, predates that, and I had not double checked that. So appreciate that comment, and I am most certainly before I give this again going to go back and take a look at it. Um, any other comments or questions at this point? Thank you so much, Tom. Um, I don't see any other questions right now. Um, so I think we can wrap it up today. And like I said, if you have any more questions for Tom, you can email him directly. His email is up on the screen here. Um, and I just wanna add that our next webinar will be April 28th. The topic will be a case study of sustainable development using climate insurance to promote fisheries management in the Caribbean. So that should be really interesting. You can go to our website and sign up, or you can email me. Um, did I see another question come up? I saw something pop up. Okay, someone said, good presentation, Tom. And yes, to answer this question, there will be a recording, and I will be sending it out later on, and it will also be on the website. So yes, you can share it with students. And another question here, <laughs> now they're coming in. Um, we are sending out PDHs. We will send those out. You'll get an email. And that's it. Thank you for the presentation. Someone said, um, good review, the, good to review this stuff. Okay. Thank you so much, Tom. We appreciate it. And everyone have a great day. All right. Thank you, everyone. Appreciate it. Thank Bye -bye. you.